Coming up on DTNS, is it the end of the wake word for voice assistance? Why China made Amp Group cancel its huge IPO and Walmart calls time on shelf scanning robots. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And producing today's show, I'm Amos. Yes, Roger Chang has the week off, uh, but thank you, Amos, uh, for jumping in and filling in. We're also joined today by Nicole Lee, Senior Editor at Engadget. How's it going, Nicole? Hello. Happy to be here. Happy to have you here. We were just talking about godparents and Spotify on the Apple Watch and so much more on Good Day Internet. You can get that expanded show by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Gboard users on Google's Pixel phones are starting to see an enhanced voice typing experience. It uses Google Assistant for better recognition and prediction, including some efficient features like saying clear to delete whatever you just voice typed. You can also use auto punctuation and faster voice typing, which doesn't use the cloud to process your voice. Google's Project Zero discovered a high severity flaw in GitHub's actions workflow commands and reported it to GitHub back on July 21st. GitHub issued an advisory on October 1st and deprecated the vulnerable commands, but argued the vulnerability should be classed as moderate. Now, Project Zero proactively offered GitHub a 14-day grace period on the 90-day disclosure, extending it to November 2nd. And like me in junior high, the day before the deadline, GitHub asked for a 48-hour extension to notify customers and fix a hard date sometime in the future. Project Zero declined and disclosed the details of the bug on Monday. Some people who have ordered the Oculus Quest 2 Elite strap with battery and carrying case said that they've received emails that their orders have been delayed. The email says Oculus is, quote, investigating some customer quality reports and has paused shipping while it looks into the problem. Hmm. Other people on Reddit have reported that the strap is indeed breaking. Bloomberg sources say Apple and its overseas suppliers are producing three Macs with Apple Silicon inside. Uh, this is what we expect to hear in their November announcement. New 13-inch, 16-inch MacBook Pros, and a new 13-inch MacBook Air. Foxconn is reportedly assembling the two smaller laptops, and Quanta Computer is building the larger MacBook Pro, again, according to the sources. Did you know that Twitch's logo is called Glitch? I did not. Well, now you do. And it's I important do. to know because Twitch just announced that TwitchCon, which had been canceled in 2020, is being replaced by an online event called GlitchCon, happening on November 14th. We don't have any other details, but something's brewing. I, uh, just calling something streaming over the internet GlitchCon seems like you're inviting trouble, but all right. It really does, yeah. Uh, let's talk a little more about the end of robots. Yeah, the Wall Street Journal reports that Walmart is ending its contract to use Bossa Nova Robotics robots to keep track of its inventory in 500 of its store locations. Five years ago, Walmart began using the six-foot-tall inventory scanning machine, so they're big. They're gonna, if you're in the aisle with them, you're going to notice. They're the Wall apologies. Street Journal said that Walmart may have ended the partnership because increased online ordering meant that more humans were going to the shelves to fulfill online orders and could be used to do inventory instead of robots. Also, some in-store shoppers apparently just weren't crazy about being around a bunch of robots. Walmart said that it will continue to testing new technologies. However, Bossa Nova Robotics laid off 50% of its staff. Yeah, my first response to this was, ah, humans win a victory. My second response was, only because the robots were limited to shelf scanning. If the robots could do the inventory, the robots would win. So eventually we'll get robots that can do that. And then at the very end, I was like, wait, replacing the robots with humans that already had jobs at Walmart ended up with Bossa Nova having to lay off humans. So is this right. some clever win for the robots? Uh, Nicole, what did you think of this? Is is it a win for the robots? And is it a win for? I don't know. It's very confusing. I think it's kind of um, just a, a, the pro. It's still it's still too early to tell. Like it's it's just it's the beginning of. They're just trying things out, and it's not. It, it didn't work this time. It doesn't. That doesn't mean it's gonna work. Not gonna work next time. It's just you know they they, they might have inventory robots in the future, and it might be as easy as you know stocking shelves and doing all the mundane work of keeping inventory and like all that stuff so i think that'd be fine yeah i mean the whole kind of like hey listen we're in a pandemic things have changed for 
lots of large stores, Walmart being one of them. You know, we, we kind of need humans on the ground to do things a little bit differently. That makes sense to me. The, the other part of the story of, of in-store customers who are still going into Walmart stores physically and saying, I don't like, I don't like that. You know, <laughs> that does not make me happy. You know, I don't want to be around that robot. That's the thing that's, you know, I kind of laughed about it at first, but it's like, I wonder why. I wonder what that is because it's, again, it's not, this is not a, uh, you know, you know, you're not at the cash register. You're not talking. It's just kind of doing its thing around you like a Roomba, I guess, but just goes to show you sometimes people just aren't ready. I mean, once it becomes normalized, we don't notice anymore, right? Yeah. But it's yeah. the novelty of it where people are like, whoa, there's a robot in here. And there's a little bit of that robots are taking our jobs thing out <laughs> sure. there. Sure, yeah. Uh, and in the middle of a pandemic, when people are getting laid off, I could see that, you know, CEO John Ferner of Walmart was like, I was apparently worried that customers would not like seeing the robots in the company stores. So that's part of it, too. But uh, in Bossa Nova Robotics Defense, there was nothing wrong with the, what the robots were doing. The technology worked and it's proven. Uh, and it kind of sucks for them to be like, yeah, our technology totally worked. But suddenly there was a pandemic and you have all this online ordering, which meant that humans were walking the floor a lot more and suddenly the efficiency we had went away. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think it does mean that Bossa Nova Robotics has a future, right? It's not like their technology didn't work and it's not like this is the condition we'll have forever. Like sure. you said, Nicole, we'll get we'll get robots that will be able to do inventory at some point. And maybe Boston also, Nova Robotics will be that company. I'm thinking a look. I, I look. I'm thinking a look at the robot. It's completely like innocuous looking. It's like just. It's <laughs> a, just just a. <laughs> right. Yeah. It seems so friendly, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> oh, it's just scanning a shelf. What could possibly? Well, be? listen. If you ha if you have a contract with a company like Walmart, I mean, that's a big get. So yeah, Boston mm -hmm. Nova's got a you know you know. Lay off some people, you know, go back to the drawing board. I assume, you know, mm -hmm. there, there, you know, there's, there's definitely a future ahead for this kind of thing. Scientists at Carnegie Mellon University have trained a machine learning model to tell when you're talking to something just by the sound of your voice. It can estimate the direction from which your voice is projected, not just the direction it arrives, because your voice may arrive from multiple directions after bouncing off walls and such, right? There's something called multipathing. This can tell, oh, the voice is actually coming. The source of the voice isn't the wall. The source of the voice is over there. The system does that uh, by noting which sound is first and clearest. That's the one that's usually coming from the projection source because other sounds bounce around and tend to get muffled and delayed. It also takes into account that human speech frequencies vary based on the direction. Higher frequencies are more directional. The, what we're saying directly to you is going to have more higher frequencies. When it bounces around, it starts to lose those higher frequencies and has uh, a lower frequency. So it's able to tell that as the higher frequencies get absorbed during reflection. The model can work on a device, doesn't need the cloud to process, uh, so less privacy problems there, but also less power. It, it, it's easier to implement that way. One use uh, for it could be to let a smart speaker know when you are looking at it and talking to it, eliminating the need to use a wake word in those situations. If it knows like, oh, you're looking right at the smart speaker, I don't even have to use a camera because that has privacy implications too. I can tell you're talking to me. Uh, it also might be able to tell when a person's actually in the room with it, which would be a nice little bit of a security thing. Like you can't just play someone's recording because it's going to sound different and it's going to come from different directions. Uh, the code has been released publicly. It'll be a while before it gets implemented into any actual devices, though. You know, we were talking in the pre-show of, uh, you know, because I think... For, for some folks, it might be a little bit hard to, you know, wrap your head around, okay, what are we doing here? You know, it's, it's don't I just say the wake word? But, you know, let's say I, I'm talking to Nicole and Nicole is facing away from me. I mm -hmm. would say, hey, Nicole, you know, and she go, oh, you're talking to me, you know? Yeah. Okay, let, now we're engaging. It's the wake word for Nicole, yeah. Right, but, if, but <laughs> right. if we're standing right next to each other and I say something, she knows I'm talking to her because I'm there and there's that engagement. Mm -hmm. So this just... This gets me kind of excited. I mean, it seems like we're getting closer to just a little bit more that normal language that comes with a smart home and certain devices. 
I think also as more and more devices are able to have these voice commands, like not just your one echo mm. speaker, but like your five echo speakers in your, your five Alexa things in your home, uh, it will be more even more important to figure out which is the thing that's listening, which is the thing that's able to respond to what you're saying. Yeah, that directionality is part of it too, right? I was yeah. I want an answer from the echo that's in the living room because I'm looking in the living room, even though my voice will bounce into the other room where the one in the kitchen hears it, it'll be like, oh, that one's not meant for me because uh, yeah. Tom's talking that direction. Uh, like we said, it probably won't get rid of the need for a wake word because you're right, Sarah, sometimes you aren't going to be looking at the thing you want to hear it, yeah. hear you. And so yeah. you'll like, 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 like the wake word for Nicole, you, you'll have that wake word for, you know, to be like, hey, I'm talking hey, to you even though I'm not pointed at you. Uh, but it would be nice to be able to like, oh, I'm I'm looking right at my echo right now. So I can just say, hey, well, what's the weather? I, I don't have to, I don't, just like when I'm talking to a person. So this is a nice little advance here. And I like that it's publicly yeah. available code. Anybody can go grab it and start imp trying to implement it. For sure. Well, we got a couple interesting notes, uh, news notes about messaging apps here. So let's start with WhatsApp, which has updated its storage usage storage usage tool to add thumbnails of content to be deleted and adding the ability to group data by forwarded many times and larger than five megabytes, hmm. along with previous ways of categorizing messages. Meanwhile, peer-to-peer -peer offline messaging app Bridgeify, which uses Bluetooth and Wi-Fi to, to directly route messages even when there isn't any internet service, has added end-to-end -end encryption using the Signal protocol. The app has been used to avoid censorship and outages in Hong Kong, the U.S., Thailand, Nigeria, and most recently for communication in earthquake-hit areas of Turkey and Greece. Yeah, this Bridgeify app is, is, is interesting. Um... What's the name of there's a uh, there's another system uh, that I was a Kickstarter backer for that was that was trying to do this uh, with an add on uh, device. Um, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but there have been a few of these these sorts of, of attempts to do this kind of messaging using the equipment of your phone, even when the Internet's either overloaded or down. Uh, a lot of times in the U.S., it's not that the Internet got cut. It's that everybody's using the Internet and it gets swamped. And so this is a way to not use the internet. There also might be fears of surveillance. And so if you're using a direct mm -hmm. situation, that avoids having it out on the open internet. But if it wasn't end -end encrypted, it could still be observed uh, if, if uh, people knew it was happening. So end-to-end -end encryption as part of this on the activist side, on the protest side, uh, is something that that people have wanted. Uh, and the end-to-end -end -end encryption for disaster recovery probably is just a a sensible security precaution because you may be talking about sensitive stuff and you only want your message to go to the people who need it. Uh, but uh, it's it's not it's it's also just a, an important use for Bridgeify, uh, especially as as it was created because of earthquakes in Mexico and it's most recently being used because of earthquakes uh, in Turkey and Greece. I'm fascinated with with that ability to say like, hey, we've got all this uh, equipment in smartphones, mm -hmm. uh, we don't need a cloud service. Like we can broadcast directly to each other with Bluetooth, uh, with Wi-Fi. Uh, and I'm, I'm surprised we haven't seen more of these kinds of apps out there. Yeah, and I kind of, I, and what, what you said earlier about uh, the whole surveillance issue and the, the, the nanny state uh, of uh, being able to like, you know, capture your WhatsApp messages and Facebook being able to access and all that sort of thing. This is a way to like not have that, right? Or, or at least or at least one way to do that. Of course, there's the there's the potential for misuse. And I, I kind of kind of see that too. But hopefully there are ways to like have that encryption like, uh, be stronger and have that more oversight there. But um, it'd be very interesting to see how this is going to be used for like, you know, protest movements and that kind of thing. Well, yeah. And it's, you know, it's all sort of the examples of like, here's why this works is like disaster stuff, you know, yeah. or something like a protest situation, you know, where, where you know, there's, you know, uh, there is a stifling of communication in general. But just to be able to say, Oh yeah, no. I mean, I we can all talk to each other because we're, you know, we're using the Bridgeify same, kind of thing. Yeah. Like that. That is that's sort of the next progression of this, and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Gotenna was the one that I was trying to think of a minute ago, uh, and and uh, that one's still around. Fire Chat I used a little bit for a while. It seems to 
as TechCrunch refers to it, uh, ga be gathering mothballs. Uh, but mm. but that that's another one that attempted to do the same thing. I remember one of the earliest versions of this was meant for airports because airport Wi-Fi was so bad for so long. <laughs> oh there's like, well, if you want to yeah. chat with somebody in the airport, uh, here, here's one that that'll just <laughs> use your available uh, that's, broadcast. Yeah, ability. that's a great example of like, doesn't have to be a disaster. Just, right. you know, it's a place, you know, you got a lot of people, you know, we're all moving. Time is of the essence. You want to be able to communicate. Hey, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. We get a lot of great story ideas. I look at it every day. We look at it for Daily Tech headlines, too. So uh, keep those stories going. Submit them and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Ant Group has pulled its stock listing from Star Market in Shanghai, as well as the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. This is a big deal. Ant's stock was set to debut Thursday and raised $34 billion, which would have made it the biggest stock debut in history, beating last December's Saudi Aramco IPO. Reuters reports Ant's controlling shareholder, Alibaba co-founder Jack Ma, and two other Ant executives met with four different Chinese financial regulators Monday, all in one meeting, and were told that Ant's online lending business needed to face further government scrutiny. China's banking regulator released new rules that same day on micro-lending, which would impact Ant's consumer and business lending unit. We don't know if that's related. Certainly wouldn't be the only thing that Ant was facing that would make it cancel a huge IPO like this. Ant operates Alipay. Alipay is the main payment and system in China. Uh, I mean, it's an online payment system, but it is the main way you pay for stuff in China. Uh, it is, is long surpassed cash, credit cards, et cetera. Uh, Ant also sells insurance and mutual funds, Ant manages China's largest money market mutual fund, but Ant Group bills itself as a technology company, not a financial company, and therefore it avoids some of the capital requirements and other regulations that banks are subject to in China. Sound familiar? This has happened a lot in the U.S., and here it is an example in China. Uh, Jack Ma may also have irritated the Chinese government. At a fintech conference last month, Ma compared traditional banks to pawn shops and appeared to flatly contradict China's vice president, Wang Qishan. At the conference, the vice president said that China needed to safeguard its financial system from systemic risks. Seems like a perfectly non-controversial thing for the vice president of China to say. But Jack Ma, speaking later, said, quote, there's no systemic financial risks in China because there's no financial system in China. Uh, so the general feeling about Jack Ma is that He's been veering a little farther from government control than they would like. And therefore, after the meeting Monday, Ant Group said in a statement that it is, quote, committed to implementing the me and meeting opinions in depth and continuing our course based on the principles of stable innovation, embrace of regulation, and service to the real economy and win-win cooperation. So Ant is talking all the nicest things it can say, uh, but it doesn't change the fact that this IPO is done. This is not happening. Uh, and everyone from China's national pension to BlackRock uh, was buying into this thing. And now Ant Group says that early subscribers to the IPO will have their money refunded. Uh, I mean, this is this is titanic in the financial world, and it's very interesting in the technology world, I think. Nicole, what, what, <laughs> what do you what do you make of this? It it is it's certainly in Asia quite a story this morning, and um, the whole kind of Jack Ma was he behaving in a way that you know set the Chinese government off to the point that this would get stifled. I mean, it's a pretty big deal. I think it is because you know Jack Ma is one of the probably one of the most successful stories out of China in the past I don't know decade or so, uh, and uh, you know he is definitely one of the, the one of the shining stars I think of the whole um, China's new sort of newfound uh, capitalist technology focused uh, movement here, and to see him going against the government like this is is kind of a soap opera and a drama in the making here, and it's. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they'll still make money, right? Like, that's kind of their thing. But um, this whole IPO pooling thing, I don't know where this is going to go. I mean, I don't know either. I mean, they will eventually IPO again, but it'll be years yeah. now. 
Like, because it, it'll take a long time for them to unwind all this. They'll have to win back trust. They'll have to prove to people, like, you're not going to have the government pull the rug out from under you again. Like, uh, this this is going to keep Ant from IPOing for a while. It's a, it's unfortunate, but um, you know, this is this has this has been a long time coming. I feel like they have been at loggerheads for a while now. Um, so I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens next. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the way that finances, you know, transactions happen and and it, the fact that Jack Ma said there's no systemic financial risks because there's no financial system in China doesn't mean like there's no finances. I mean, I, I feel like I get, you know, maybe a flippant way to say we, we you know, we're in the future now. Right. Um, so for the government to say, yeah, I don't know, like this, there, look, there's I mean a little... A little bit too much power going on here, which is not untrue. <laughs> Who ever heard of a tech entrepreneur uh, claiming uh, against the government's wishes that they were immune uh, to regulation uh, in sure. ways that previous yeah. companies wouldn't have been? Uh, so true. Well, let's talk Hollywood, shall we? The Wall Street Journal notes that the trend of Hollywood visual effects artists going to work for Google, Facebook, and Apple is real. Artists from ILM, Digital Domain, WIDA, and more have moved to tech companies for higher salaries, job security, more hours, and better benefits. Movie effects have seen falling prices and falling compensation as a result. Whereas tech companies are increasing spending on AR from $21 billion this year to an expected $121 billion by 2023. That's according to Accenture. Award-winning visual effects artist and head of the USC Institute for Creative Technologies, Paul Debevec, has been working for Google for four and a half years and has brought three colleagues over with him. Debevec helped design the light stage, that's a nine foot diameter spherical device with 14,000 lights and more than 40 cameras that captures and recreates actors' heads, like Brad Pitt in Benjamin Button. Think of it that way. Debevec also helped Google build its own version that can capture the entire body, not just the head, to help create convincing digital people the whole body for AR. Apple bought facial tracking uh, technology developed by Debevec's predecessor at USC, Hao Li, and used it in its Animoji. Some of Li's colleagues went to work for Apple shortly after the sale. So we're seeing a bit of a trend. Yeah, I mean, uh, the guy who made Benjamin Button now works for Google. Like that's that's yeah. the that's the log line here, right? Like uh, we. We are going to see once augmented reality finally happens. We're we're in the the BlackBerry and Palm Trio stage of augmented reality, uh, right? Like it exists. There are products. It's kind of okay. You can kind of see what it might do. But at some point, it's going to happen, and suddenly we're going to get that level of avatars and reality in front of us, and that's it's kind of exciting. What will happen to the movies, Tom? <laughs> The uh, they'll they'll still find uh, uh, <laughs> visual effects artists with stars in their eyes, fresh out of college, to to work at the VFX mines. I guess uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. Like I I think it'll be I think the movie industry will be fine because I feel like Hollywood has its own star power. You know, I know the tech companies have money and all of that other stuff, but there's the glamour and there's right. the, the 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 fame and all of the trappings of Hollywood. I'm sure that will still be a draw for many people. Academy Awards and Emmy Awards and all that stuff. Like that's totally enough of a draw for a lot of people. I mean, I think all three of us know that uh, media tends to try to tell you that you don't need to make as much money with them because you get to work in media. And isn't that fun? Uh, that's right. why we all work for ourselves here now. Well, and I, you know, I think a lot of, you know, sort of the uh, the longstanding Hollywood studios that have made lots of money but don't necessarily seem like the forefront of technology will be very different companies in just a few years. Yeah, I mean, I think they're becoming Hollywood companies, right? You look at Amazon, you look at Apple, they're they're making content too. So there's some you, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Well, let's celebrate an anniversary, shall we? Oh, oh yeah. Who's anniversary? Nintendo and Amazon, speaking of Amazon, are celebrating Mario's 35th anniversary by sending out some Amazon orders in Mario themed boxes. So you don't necessarily get one, but you might. Getting a box is random. You aren't, aren't guaranteed. But again, you might get one. Amazon also launched a new Super Mario Splash page featuring a timeline of the franchise. Yeah, um, 
this is fun. I've I've gotten Nicole's uh, laughing, and I bet I know why. Uh, it's just why are you box. laughing, Nicole? It's just a box. It's a box. You're gonna throw it's away the box. box, unless you're a huge Mario fan, I guess, which you might keep it. Box. Well, and if you're a huge Mario <laughs> fan and you know about this and you don't get the box, you'd be like, "What did I do?" Yeah, exactly. I want the box. <laughs> this is actually we're doing Amazon and Nintendo a disservice by talking about this story. This is the kind of thing that works if you don't know it's coming, right? right if your right. box shows up and it's like special Mario 35th anniversary, you're like, "Oh, that's cool." But if you want it because you heard about it on Daily Tech News Show and there's no way for you to get it, you're just going to keep ordering stuff and being frustrated because it comes in the plain old brown box. Could you imagine if somebody got the box and then eBayed it for oh. like? Oh, I'm sure that will happen. Right? Oh, I'm, oh, I'm so, positive. I'm yeah, there's going to... Pull you know, it up and look right now. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff out there, DTNS audience member, is like, I did not get my Mario box. I want it. And he's I will pay top eBay. dollar. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> or a few dollars, anyway. Yeah. Hey, it's a box. Uh, They're very <laughs> useful. Not. I'm not finding it yet. I'm looking on <laughs> eBay right now. Um <laughs> Amazon mystery box, Amazon return box. <laughs> wow, you can get Amazon wholesale return boxes full of unknown stuff. What? They auctioned it on eBay. We we may have unlocked a whole meme. Yeah, I can't finish the show. I have to look at these return boxes. It's yeah. like a blind box of returned electronics. <laughs> and and you might get something good or not. Five bucks. Weird. Okay, that's Love a whole it. separate thing. Anyway, yes, I, you know, we, we got our Amazon fresh order with uh, bags that were themed for the boys the week that it premiered mm -hmm. on Amazon Prime Video. That was fun because I didn't expect it. And I was like, oh, this is cool. A nice little promotion. They were nice bags and everything. I didn't keep any of them. I didn't sell them on. I should have sold them on eBay. What was I doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I know. You got to flip that stuff, Tom. Well, I'll know for next time. Uh, meanwhile, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. So today, Tuesday, uh, November 3rd in the USA, a day like any other. Sure. But, Gre but Gregory wrote in and, you know, he, he, he had something we thought would be apropos at the end of the show. Greg says, I would very much like to thank you for not inserting your or anyone else's political opinions into the show. Personally, I tune in to hear about tech news, not the show's guests, individual opinions, I'm extraordinarily grateful for their absence. Again, thank you very much, and keep up the good work. Oh, Gregory, Gregory, thank you. Um, our our guiding principle has has always been, uh, even back when Sarah and I were doing tech news today, uh, we if it pertains to understanding tech, we're going to talk about it. We're going to give our opinions on it. But if it would get in the way of anyone enjoying understanding tech or not understanding it, then why bother? <laughs> it's not really. Not really helpful for anybody. So I'm I'm glad you appreciate that, Gregory. Yeah, yeah. We 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 try really hard not to include stories or include too too many opinions that that veer away from the the tech aspect of it. So so yeah. Thanks, Gregory, and thanks to everybody who writes us feedback, questions, comments, all that good stuff. If you've got one, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that email. Indeed it is. Let's shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Ali Sanjabi, Paul Thiessen, and Kevin. I just have to always say it that way. Kevin, love ya. Thanks also to Nicole Lee. Nicole, it's been a while. So glad to have you back on the show. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Um, you can always go to twitter.com slash Nicole, although in the days following the election. I'm not sure if you want to, uh, but you can go ahead and check it, check it there if you want to. And I, I, was, I, was started, I also recently started a new newsletter, new newsletter uh, at uh, nicolee.substack.com. And uh, it's about food and tech and culture and things like that. I'm cool. still trying it out, but uh, go ahead and subscribe and see what you get. Excellent. Go check it out, nicolee.substack.com. Also, don't forget, uh, there is an ad-free version of DTNS. You might be listening to it right now. Uh, support us on Patreon, and you can get your own personal RSS feed supported directly by you. Cut out the middleman. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Folks, we're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more and tell a friend, dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com.
Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>